G'day guys, um, this video is on thyroid and uh, some of the information we know in regards to the importance of certain nutrients like selenium, not just iodine. Let's get in a, into it. I'll just share my screen. So selenium and the thyroid gland, all good news for clinicians. So there's a review article looking at a whole lot of studies. The thyroid is an organ with the highest selenium content per gram of tissue. So it's important. And if you take a look in the actual thyroid itself, there are not, you know, there are secondary things like zinc and copper and a few other things. Um, and, but the two primary ones, which also help with the actual conversions a selenium and iodine too important so if you don't have enough one or the other you're going to have problems because it expresses specific um, selenoproteins and there are specific selenoproteins i've talked about um, the detoxifying of heavy metals with selenide which is one of them that is actually produced in the body to basically you know, assist the liver in detoxing um, heavy metals. So I've discussed that before. So I won't get into that one, but there are a whole lot of other classes that actually have an important role within the thyroid. Since the discovery of myxoedematous cretinism and the thyroid destruction, and then they say following um, selenium repletion in iodine and selenium, deficient children, um, the data on links between thyroid metabolism and selenium have multiplied. So they've, you know, once they actually saw that even in children that had iodine deficiency, that when they gave them selenium, they actually noticed really important improvements. Um, so where iodine helps with the thyroid function, selenium goes one step further it not only helps with all the conversions of the t4 to t3 and all the other stuff but also has a whole lot of other effects within the thyroid as well which are autoimmune related and a number of other things so it's a it's a bit of a swiss army knife this is the sort of condition you know cretinism sort of a You'll, you'll actually get it characterized by growth in skin lesions, central nervous system problems, dysfunction, multiple skeletal deformities um, can occur in young animals that are fed severely deficient diet. And this is the sort of stuff that we're actually, we actually see, you know, really severe sort of, uh, you know, this is endemic cretinism, you know, the uh, malformalities, um, and even dwarfism so this is another type of a endocrine type hypothyroidism congenital hypothyroidism children you know actually in the womb and all that dwarfism is very much associated so a lot of these conditions are actually associated with um you know hypothyroidism so as I say to people, when you have a thyroid problem, you're going to have problems, you know, in that regard. You're going to have a lot of problems. You know, when we're looking at sort of the thyroid, it plays a big role, even in macrophage and all these other mechanisms that are related. Remember the body actually, you know, fibrosis, impaired repair, all these sort of things. Remember, I've tried to explain to you guys that you have to think in dynamics. The body's an interacting of all sorts of enzymes, all sorts of systems and all that. It's not just these single reductionist pathways that people seem to get fixated, you know, get your head out of the and understand that the body is a complex organism, that there's a lot of things that are interacting at the same time. So giving a lot of, you know, there's, there's a thing called hot nodes 
And it's been found when you give very high doses of, and I've heard a number of people recently talking about iodine in very high doses um, with hot nodes, that can be a problem because some people can even you know, get hospitalized from hot nodes. Also, they can actually end up dead. So it can be a problem. Selenium plays an important role. There are synergies between, I've talked about this before, between selenium and iodine. And it's really important to understand the synergies that you can't discount and ignore these things. Anyway, so if you have, you know, there's a lot of people who are vagoonerized that don't eat enough, don't get enough selenium or get too much. And that cause other issues like they take Brazil nuts, which are extremely high and can cause other conditions, which I'll get into shortly. So you got to be very careful if you're not getting enough and you take iodine supplementation and you've got hot nodes, you could end up in hospital. you got to know what you're doing and you've got to get it from the food. An animal-based diet is more balanced in all these sort of things. So you're not going to get into much trouble in that regard. Um, obviously, when it, you're looking at um, an ancestral way, it would have been organ meats, which would have given you basically some of these important nutrients. They also, we know from the N15 data, when we look at populations, they lived close to rivers and close to, and so they would have gone so, some iodine from those river sources, you know, so really important in that regard. And it would have worked synergistically with selenium. But anyway, let's move on. All through very minor amounts of selenium appear sufficient for adequate activity of the diodonases, thus limiting the impact of potential deficiency on the synthesis of thyroid hormones. So really important, selenium status appears to have any impact on the development of thyroid pathologies. So the value of selenium supplementation in autoimmune thyroid disorders has been emphasized. Most of the authors attribute the effects of the supplementation on the immune system to the regulation on the production of reactive oxygen species and their metabolites. In patients with Hashimoto's disease and in pregnant women with um, anti-TPO antibodies and the TG as well, there is, um, selenium supplementary decreases antithyroid antibodies levels and improves ultrasound structures of the thyroid gland. So when they actually do ultrasounds, they actually see an important change in the thyroid gland. All through, clinical applications still need to be um, defined. Hashimoto's disease, there, is very there are very interesting for pregnant women, given that supplementation significantly decreases the percentage of postprandial thyroiditis and definitive hypothyroidism. In Graves' disease, selenium supplementation results in um, ethroidism being achieved more rapidly and appears to have beneficial effects on mild inflammatory orbital orbitopathy. Two, and then they talk about this risk, which I think is a nonsense risk. Um, a risk of diabetes has been reported following long-term selenium supplementations but few data are available of the side effects associated with such supplementations. Further studies are required. Now, most of these are basically rat studies. That's what they are. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay, selenium and diabetes evidence from animal studies. This is the sort of stuff we get. And they are excessive amounts. Where selenium was found to act as an insulin mimic and to be anti-diabetic in earlier studies, because it is in normal amounts, you know, in normal amounts, it actually improves insulin sensitivity. You know, it actually improves, reduces the problems of, you know, of diabetes and stuff like that. It has a, a positive effect, but that's in normal eating it, getting it from the food. Recent animal experiments and human trials have shown unexpected risks of prolonged high selenium intake in potentiating insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. 
elevating dietary selenium intake of 0.4 to 3.0 milligrams per kilogram of diet above the nutrient requirements similar to overproduction of selenoproteins. And that's the problem. Led to an insulin resistance and to a diabetic phenotype in mice, rats, and pigs. Okay. Now, what are these amounts? Let's take a look. Point four. We'll go to the for the lower one times somebody that's 70 kilos as a human being, which is 150 um, pounds, 154 pounds to be more precise. That's like 28 milligrams. Okay. What is the actual selenium? 55 micrograms is the daily RDI. I actually disagree with that. It should be something like between 250 up to 500 for therapeutic reasons. Like if you've got cancer or something like that, but up to around about 250 has been shown to reduce in a, um, in a study done in Poland, reduce cancer rates by 46% at 200 micrograms by 42%, which was an American study um, earlier. And I read that flying overseas in 2006 um, in um, Scientific America. So it was back then. So I was well aware of the importance of selenium um, in the diet. I used to eat a few Brazil nuts now and then, but I don't anymore because you could potentially get very high levels, which isn't a good idea. Much better to get it from animal foods. We'll go into that shortly. But basically, you know, this is a substantial difference, you know. So when we're looking at milligrams to MCG. So twenty-eight. Put that in. As you can see, it's twenty-eight thousand. Twenty-eight thousand micrograms. So twenty-eight, even at the top level, which is five hundred micrograms, that's fifty-six times. That's way beyond the physiological requirements, 56 fold. So those animal studies are irrelevant. Nobody's gonna consume this amount. They would have to supplement heavily. You know, you can't get it from foods at these quantities, 56 times the top limit that I would put, which is 500 micrograms. So it's just nonsense. So let's just ignore those rat studies because they are way beyond, and that's the lower limit. That is the lower limit, remember? That's the lower limit we were looking at. So the upper limit is three that they actually did. So that was from 20, that's 56 fold. Let's do the other one, three times 70. <laughs> okay, let's look at this, 210. That's at the top end that I want, that I don't want people to go over. That's 420 fold, massive. So it's nonsense. So people need to stop. This is why I talk about reductionism. I, I rail against it and I rail against certain um, animal studies that are done inappropriately with these high doses, which is outside the physiology. You would never consume that. It's nonsense. But this is the, all your fucking gurus out there, this is the sort of shit that they will actually can, um, you know, talk about and go, ooh, you know, in animal, in animals, in rat studies, they've shown it to cause diabetes. Because they're twats. You know, that's the problem we get on with reductionism. 
when you're outside the physio normal physiological range, you know, that can tell you basically what will happen at very high amounts. But look how high you have to go. At the top end, 500 microgram, um, the micrograms, you have to go 56 times before you even get to the bottom end of diabetes, of, uh, you know, of causing, having a link to making diabetes worse. Nobody's going to get to that level. We need to basically be logical and stick to what has actually been shown that in the lower levels, it's actually is quite, you know, when they talk here in the earlier studies, yeah, because those earlier studies actually were more within the physiology of humans, in the normal physiology of what you get in foods. That's why they actually showed an, an improvement in terms of, uh, you know, an anti-diabetic effect. You know, I mean, anything, even high, excessively high doses of vitamin D can actually create massive calcification. But who would recommend some stuff like that unless they were a complete crackpot, you know? So it's just illogical. These are sort of illogical, outside normal physiological range um, in that regard. So please ignore that nonsense that's out there because there's a lot of it, unfortunately. It drives me up the wall constantly when I have to listen to this absolute nonsense in that regard. Oops, not that. No, we've talked about um, those disease sort of issues. I'm not really interested. Anyway, in addition to the role it plays in metabolism of thyroid hormones, and it's really important in the in these hormones, selenium appears to have an impact on thyroid volume. This is important, especially if people have, you know, like goiters or stuff like that. In the children with goiter, living in areas where there are iodine and selenium deficiencies, iodine repl repletion alone does not reduce the volume. Got it? So just because they're adding um, iodine in there is not going to reduce the volume of the goiter. So people out there mega dosing on iodine, not a good thing, especially if you've got a goiter and you've got nodes, which can be very dangerous. So I'm not against um, uh, you know, iodine, but I am critical of people basically ignoring the synergistic relationship between iodine and selenium and does not improve thyroid function. Got it? So if you've got a, lot, a bit of goiter, adding um, iodine in there is not going to improve the thyroid function. It can unbalance it too much. You know, iodine is good, for instance, if you've got like, in those receptor sites, there are, you know, like fluoride and all sorts of other um, sort of uh, environmental toxins that tend to basically, um, you know, accumulate within the thyroid gland. Iodine is really good at removing that sort of stuff. And, you know, so I'm not against iodine, but what I'm saying is you've got to re remember that iodine needs to be, there is a synergy between selenium and iodine to get it in the diet. In reality, the more severe the selenium deficiency, the less iodine supplementation helps to reduce thyroid volume. Got it? So if you're really depleted in selenium, the iodine supplementation even does even a less of a job to reduce. So it has no effect, you know? And that was in the French study, the Subimax study. Correlation between thyroid volume and selenium status was only established in women. So far, the molecular mechanism making women more sensitive to low selenium intake has not been elucidated. So we don't know. We, we can see it actually helps and all that. There's a negative correlation found between thyroid volume and plasma selenium levels, but the results are only statistically significant for the general population or the subject supplemented with iodine. So they work together. You've got to have both. Therefore, the effects of selenium status on thyroid volume does not appear to be related to iodine deficiency, but it's more to do with its own requirements. Also, they do say, finally, in the study, low plasma selenium concentration were correlated with for a risk of multiple nodes over 10 
millimeters in size, but did not impact the risk of developing solitary nodes. But they were using lower, lower amounts in this, um, in that regard as well. And there's a link between a selenium and, thyro and thyroid cancers as well. It's been established that was a, a Norwegian study. But anyway, let's move on. Now, this is a really interesting study because what they did was they actually used the medication levonothroxin and selenium levels, and they wanted to see the effects on the anti The Basically, they wanted to look at the antibodies, which is part of the autoimmune disease of hypothyroidism. So I'm not going to read this because it's just going to take too long. Basically, all they're saying down here, selenium supplementations may help to reduce the levels of anti bodies in patients with autoimmune hypothyroidism, which is, we're talking about here, things like Hashimoto's. So let's go down. They really did stuff on, and this was a randomized um, uh, study. So let's go to the images. Okay, that's supposed to be control. It's, they've misspelt it, not troll, <laughs> and the treatment group. <laughs> uh, Okay, so when we're looking at the antibody TPO, as you can see, the before and after, um, pretty much the control isn't really doing any better. But the treatment group actually really did come down from very high levels. So as you can see, there was a reduction in the TPO um antibodies okay supposed to be below below about 100 odd but this is you know this is a small trial period so and the level of selenium used was much lower than i would recommend but that's you know this problem with trials i don't use good enough levels um means of selenium going up you know yeah whatever I'd be going to, I'd be trying to get the levels much higher, but you know, then the means of the anti-TG, which is another antibody type thing, uh, the treatment group, which had selenium much lower than the other one was just the medication, as you can see. And so for this type of antibody, you had a risk, but remember the other, the other type of antibody up here, the TPO, which is the big one, as you can see, the medication didn't really do much. It was the selenium that actually did much better result. Just to make, just to point that out. But for this um, type of antibody, the TG one, there was a reduction from the medication, but markedly much higher from the selenium, the one with the medication selenium. Um, TSH coming anything below, um, you know, around about two-ish um, is indicative because you usually basically when you've got very high TSH, your body's just pumping out TSH, but the conversions are not happening. And we know that iodine and selenium are very important for the conversions because there's hollow receptors in the thyroid for those. And it's well known in the literature that it does the conversion. So it doesn't surprise me that these levels, now the medication is bringing it down, but so is basically we're seeing the same result and all that. Now, in terms of F, which is T4, In the treatment group. And T3, again, as you can see, you, you don't have this over-exaggerated effect either compared to the medication. So it actually tries to pull it back into more physiological levels, which is a good thing, actually. Um, 
So they had no conflict of interest in this study, which is interesting, which is good. So they actually showed that it does have an effect in that regard. Just for those people who wanted to, to see the antibody effect. And this is important. Look at the effect. That's just a medication on TPO, which this is a big one. And look at the massive change. That's because here, this group is actually taking, the control group is actually taking the medication. This, the, um, the treatment is actually taking the medication and, and you can see the massive effect of selenium on that. So selenium is definitely altering things. Um, this is another study that's looking at the volume and uh, they actually talk about how you know their conclusions are that um, that basically high con that low serum concentrations were associated with larger thyroid volume and higher prevalence of thyroid enlargement. So selenium plays a big role. So, that, so serum in the study, I'm not going to go through it because otherwise it'll take too bloody long. People can read it. I'll attach all the stuff so people could read it themselves. Selenium concentrations were found to be significantly negatively associated with thyroid volume. So a low selenium status significantly increased the risk of thyroid enlargement. So, so there's a significance here that the that the, you know the volume is related to the selenium status. And then further, low selenium status was a tendency to increase the risk of developing multiple nodes. This is a problem, not only in Hashimoto's, not only in hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, but also in hyperthyroidism as well. That means the opposite, you know, very high. So selenium tends to basically drag you towards the middle away from either that tendency because in too low or too high tends to create more of these um, nodules, which is a problem, you know, and these hot nodules can be very dangerous with very low selenium and very high iodine. So when people recommend high um, with hot nodes, there's potential risk there. So I tend to basically um, like to say to people, eat ancestrally, eat, eat um, animal foods, and you should get the right sort of mix. Anyway, um, let me go to iodine. Most people on a carnival diet, I mean, yes, you could use basically iodinized salt if you wanted to, but really, but if you're eating seafood, I mean, as you can see, that's, you're going to get, enough you know so let's look at cod so th that's three ounces i'm not going to eat three ounces i'm going to at least you know um because that's 85 um grams times you know that's more like what i'm going to eat in that regard so 99 times three i'm going to get more like 300 so i'm going to get more than enough if i eat fish occasionally you know if you eat fish occasionally through the week you're going to get more than enough now, if you were to eat once a week fish and divide that by seven days, you've already got 42 there. So for the 150 micrograms, minus that, you only need, you only need basically um, that amount, 100. So minus, um, you know, boiled eggs, you know, 12, one, two, three, four. So four eggs already got you down to that level. Four eggs and a glass of, and a glass of milk. It's done the job. So basically, once a week fish, glass of milk every day, and it only has to be an eight. You know, I don't even consume that. I actually consume about nearly sixteen ounce glasses um, of milk. So double that. So for me. I eat fish uh, as well, twice a week sometimes. So 56 times two, 
is between 100 and 200, which they, they talk about. So I'm way within just from the glass of milk, plus four eggs, which I usually have, which is 1248, 160. You can get iodine very easily from the food. You know, stop supplementing people. You know, you don't need to supplement. Um, if you eat a bit of organ meats and even, even muscle meats have iodine, not a lot, but they do have, you know, combining that very easily get on a carnivore diet up to 200 with a couple of eggs, a glass of milk and some steaks. So get over it. You don't need to supplement iodine, you know, so in that regard. And as I've shown, selenium is the more important one. So let's look at the sources of selenium. Now, we don't want excess amounts, remember, you know, like these sort of things, these sort of levels where, you know, even these are still not in that danger zone, but you don't need it. Um, uh, you know, it's best to play it safe. Let's look at it, um, tuna. Easily. So let's, you know, micrograms in that regard. So I, I'll usually probably have about 300 grams um, or more sometimes, usually 350 to be more precise. Divide that by 8.333. You're looking at, you know, a bit over um, 12 ounces. And you get, a bit, get about 300 there you know, slightly over 300. You know, so you're going to be good. You're going to be very good in that regard. And I've done the other, you know, on mercury. If there's a, there's a video that I've done on fish and mercury, I'll stick it up there. And that one basically shows, you know, the selenide that I talked about, how it chelates and the, the ratio between mercury and all that and the type of fish, they've got the lowest ratio, sort of the best in that regard. So that's, you know, you know, things like oysters and, you know, other crustaceans are pretty good. Let's go to the regular meats, like for instance, pork as an example. So let's say uh, I usually have about five times that in terms of pork. I'll basically have about 500 grams, um, you know, 500 grams divided by 28.3 is about just slightly over a pound of pork. Um, so, you know, 16 ounces. So it's basically minus 16. That's one pound, 1 1.6 ounces. You know, so that's going to give you 47 Point four times five, 237. Fabulous. Not a problem in that regard. As I said, carnivals get plenty of selenium. They don't have to worry about. It. Even here, it's, you know, 36 compared to 47. You know, again, you're still going to be, you know, if you have a 36 times five, 180, I'd like you to be at 200 or a bit above. Let's say you go to 600, which is, you know, probably 1.2 pounds. You're up to 200. And, uh, good to go in terms of selenium. As you can see, chicken breasts, it's primarily the animal foods. These are fortified. Um, they're all fortified. But it's all the animal foods. Some mushrooms are not too bad, but it's, as you can see, it's mostly the animal foods have got plenty of selenium in that regard. I'd give Brazil nuts a bit of a miss because they can sometimes have excessive amounts. Um, and with out enough iodine can create a few issues in the thyroid at those excessive amounts. Now, let's not forget selenium is really important for glutathione. It's one of the most critical things for glutathione. Let me see if they ever have they, I think they actually mentioned it here. Selenium is an essential trace mineral. It is a constituent of 
selenoproteins proteins that play important roles in the body, including antioxidant protection, thyroid gland function, DNA synthesis, and the role in the immune system and reproduction. All that. A deficiency of selenium can lead to pain in the muscles, that's well known, and joints, that's well known in the literature, unhealthy hair, another well known thing. You know, when we talk about thyroid disease and hair um, issues, hmm. I wonder whether it's a selenium deficiency in those people. White spots on your fingernails, yes, that as well. In the long term, it may even lead to Hashimoto's disease, a condition which the body's own immune system attacks the thyroid. And excess selenium can lead to bad breath, diarrhea, and even hair loss. But that's in those really high, high levels that are basically in the in the animal models. Um, I don't think humans really get to those levels. Um, potentially, if you if you were to sit around and consume massive amounts of, uh, of basically Brazil nuts, and they tend to be the really high, potentially there's a risk there. If, you know, somebody was munching on Brazil nuts all bloody day, you know, there is a risk of that sort. So keep that in mind. In that regard, we don't need to eat an unplant type sources, which could be problematic um, in that regard. But really the importance is when it comes to selenium, it has that regulatory effect directly on the thyroid. Most people are very, very deficient because the majority of people are eating plants. And when they are eating sources um, of animal foods, they tend to be processed and processing does deplete selenium unfortunately it's, it's the reality you know real food has selenium processed food doesn't have selenium it's the same thing with um taurine processed animal foods tend to be much lower in um uh, in taurine sometimes down to zero so these are the problems with processed foods which our culture is embraced with a vengeance unfortunately because of good good marketing by the food industry but the reality is that um, eating real foods, in particular animal foods, you will get good vet levels of selenium to support good thyroid function. The problem is in plants, it usually is bound. So how much do you get from, from plant sources is usually very limited because it's bound by anti-nutrients. Um, and even when you go to Brazil nuts, you have to basically like soak them or roast them in order to release the selenium. So if you eat, eat them raw, um, it's bound and it'll probably end up like, well, in the toilet. But if you roast them, then you can actually liberate, um, you know, and access the actual um, selenium much easier. So roasted against, but it's not something that I recommend because the problem with, if they come from selenium poor soils, they vary quite a bit. With animal foods, um, animals tend to concentrate these in certain tissue types and will recycle them, to try and keep them in their system. So they tend to have less big grade variability. When it comes to plants, there is massive variability depending on the soil type. That's why they're not a reliable source of selenium. And that's why we see much higher levels of hypothyroidism and other sort of related thyroid diseases amongst um, uh, two types of people. Those who are basically uh, protein deficient because selenium is usually bound with a lot of protein, with, the, with pr protein rich animal foods. So if you basically have a lower protein intake, that can be a problem. The, you've got crackpots like Ray Pete that actually say, oh, you need, you know, to support. No, no. These guys actually consume shitloads of lean meat and that's where they get the selenium and that's where they support their thyroid. And they think it's the carbs. It's not the carbs. Um, uh, Ray Pete, um, uh, you know, aficionados, it's actually the protein. And all that basically... Um, because of the raising of insulin slightly, all the basically um, the actual carbs is, is mask the symptoms. That's all it does. It doesn't fix the symptoms. These people just 
mask the symptoms because they raise slightly their metabolic rate due to the carbohydrates in an unnatural way. And so they think that that's actually resolved, but it hasn't. You know, the underlying condition is still there. That is why the majority of people with hypothyroidism, so the, the big carb eaters, they have symptoms, but they don't really know. And if you take a look, you know, even some of the repeat fan club, you know, how many of them basically are losing their hair and have, have all sorts of issues and sitting there telling you you need carbs. Absolute nonsense, you know. I've got genetics that predispose me to basically, you know, hair loss. And my hair is quite thick, as you guys have seen, how it's become thicker um, and grows really thick from animal foods because you need protein, you need selenium, you need these important nutrients that support the thyroid. And even, you know, Hello Kitty, I mean, she used to be very cold until she started consuming more protein. And she noticed, I now feel hot. I don't have to wear as much clothing. But she used to actually, she, she always picks on me and goes, but you know, you've got no sense of cold. You don't feel the cold. You go out there in winter and you're wearing your shorts and stuff like that. Yeah, when I was doing keto, I couldn't do that. I felt cold as. I had to wear leggings to go out. You know, cause, and also thermals. I used to wear thermals because I was so bloody cold in my extremities. And now I don't because these animal foods, when you eat plenty of protein, 30 to 40% of your intake comes from protein. You know what? You don't have these problems. You've got well supported thyroid function, you've got well supported. Um, uh, but this is the thing these guys don't understand. They're actually getting. The addition, they're eating lean meat, so they're getting a lot of the, those nutrients and they're getting their energy from the wrong source. They're getting it from sugar, which is long-term damaging due to the deuterium levels, will actually reduce their efficiency, their mitochondrial efficiency over time. We, on the other hand, by using long chain fats, we will maintain good levels of mitochondrial efficiency into old age, plus we will support our general body our structures our muscles our hair our nails everything our collagen structures and all that with plenty of meat if you take a look at tribal people you see them eating a whole lot of meat with the fat that means it's important to combine both those in good amounts so in our society we've got communities which and gurus that are fixated and scared of either protein or animal fats. It's one of the two. You know, the keto community, it's all about, um, uh, you know, the animal proteins, keep it down. And then you've got the sort of the Ray Pete fan club, keep the animal fats down. They've both got it wrong. Your body needs to be furnished with good levels of animal fat and good levels of animal protein to be healthy and have vitality and stuff like that. That's what our ancestors used and still do to this day, those who are still tribal. They consume animal foods and they don't have any of these diseases. This sort of reductionist nonsense that exists out there has created a lot of health problems. And people basically go low fat and high protein and then basically put in a few carbs to basically mask those symptoms, or they basically go crazy, very low protein and very high, um, you know, fat and make themselves so catabolic and so cold as, you know, it's like a, they turn a, a diet into a fasting mimicking diet. And you've got the, this, this is the crazies, the extreme, keto or the extreme um, sort of vagoons, you know, it's very unhealthy, both of them, both of these communities. There are therapeutic usages for short-term therapeutic usages to basically where people are severely insulin resistant or severely unhealthy in order to force them into fat adaptation. And also they may have mitochondrial insufficiency. And so you want to force the body to use long chain fats for energy, not, not um, not using glucose. So if you don't put enough protein in there, it's going to be forced to use the fat. And so for therapeutic purposes, yes. But for the general population, no. 
just eat like our ancestors. A good level of protein, a good level of fat. That's all that's required for proper functioning. And when you do that, you'll get sufficient fat soluble vitamins to regulate all the collagen degrading enzymes that regulate collagen throughout the body. You know, your bones and mineralized collagen, your muscles basically, uh, you know, primarily made of largely collagen, all the filaments and all that. You basically need to, your hair, you know, is made of, um, you know, uh, proteins. Everything, you know, it's fat and proteins your body's made of and cholesterol. So you need to eat these animal foods in their entirety as a food and not fear them. I usually get fatty cuts of meat. So I get good levels of fat and good levels of protein. That's what you're supposed to do. That is the way you're supposed to live like our ancestors. And don't overcook your food because you don't want to deplete taurine. It's very essential for good health. So overcooking depletes, you know, if you can't, stomach undercooked meat or stuff like that then maybe supplement taurine but um, if you don't want to supplement you've got to basically eat your meat rare medium rare like that to retain some of these nutrients very important anyway see you this is a supplemental part so i'll just share my screen just to make a really important point here. Um, this is part on that, uh, the iodine stuff. Is too much iodine good or bad? The, to the tolerable upper intake of iodine is set at 1.1 milligrams or 1,100 micrograms for adults, 19 and older. Risk of high, I don't like the word risk anyway, high iodine intake, including hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism and goiter, um, really acute um, iodine poisoning can lead to burning the mouth, throat, stomach, fever, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weak pulse, and even coma. I've discussed that about, you know, if you've got hot nodes, you know, that can be a problem. Uh, with that said, some studies suggest that the intake of iodine is up to 1.2 milligrams per day, way higher than the upper tolerance, and can confer health benefits, including cancer protection. Japanese people get most of their iodine from kelp seafood, um, and then they talk about all this other um, sort of, uh, consult your doctor about high doses, blah, blah, blah. There's a Japanese paradox. It's only when you realize it's not a real paradox. What did I say earlier? Selenium. It's the lack of selenium that caused, even though they increased the amount when it, there was no selenium, it didn't matter how high you went, you couldn't get the volume down. You couldn't reduce the, those um, nodules. You couldn't reduce the nodules. Only with the selenium could you reduce the nodules. So high doses is not an issue as long as you're getting good levels of selenium in. And fish is a very good source of selenium. It's actually one of the higher sources of selenium. You'll realize when you look at that video that I'll attach right at the end. So the Japanese paradox is basically consuming fish, yes, and seafood. Um, and kelp and all that may give you high iodine intake, but it's balanced from the high selenium intake from the fish. That prevents that sort of problem. So as long as you're getting sufficient selenium in, higher intakes of iodine are less of a problem. It's really when you basically have those out of whack. It's a bit like, you know, your vitamin D and, and, and retinol, you know, it's really supplement, supplemental, not getting it actually from real food. When you combine real foods, you actually get better synergies. You know, this is the problem today. Um, nowadays, we were too fixated with supplements rather than thinking about real foods. When you combine these real foods, you're actually getting a whole lot of trace minerals and a whole lot of other things 
because trace minerals and protein and all these sort of things work synergistically together. So real foods confer benefit. Excess supplements that put things out of whack, you know, probably the only, as I said, the only th supplements that I actually take are things like taurine because it's an amino acid. Really, they haven't found an upper limit and all your tissue is just so much. So you can really excessive amounts as I've talked about, but I still don't recommend um, in, a, in a sense, but you know, it's not going to be an issue in that regard. But really, this is the this is really the iodine, you know, all those concerns about iodine is really a selenium deficiency. Once you correct the selenium deficiency, those iodine issues just miraculously go away. And that's why the Japanese don't have this problem because their diet is a very high, most of their protein is coming from fish, unless you're on Okinawan, which is pork. So that's the mitigating thing for the high kelp and stuff like that. It's the, it's the high fish consumption. Also very high in taurine as well. That's also the other paradox with the low C19 issues. They also supplement as a population vitamin D plus the taurine component coming, which is much higher in seafood than it is basically from ruminant animals, basically confers those additional T lymphocyte protection, stuff like that. So these were the, these paradoxes, those so-called paradoxes, they're not really, when you look at the nutrition, the underlying components of that nutrition, you realize, well, they're actually providing the micronutrients to, to basically support those important immune functions or thyroid functions or whatever else. It's basically, unfortunately, it's crackpots that basically miss all this sort of stuff because they're too fixated on reductionism and they're looking at certain pathways and miss a whole lot of other information, which is unfortunate, but that's the reality that we live in. Um, you know, gurus are fixated on things rather than seeing the body in a more synergistic and understanding that you know, ancestral foods furnish the body a lot of different nutrients and all these micronutrients work in a certain synergistic way. Anyway, that's covered that point, which I needed to make. See you.